Hi to everyone, my name is Chiara Montomoli and I am an associate professor in structural geology and tectonics at the Earth Science Department of Torino University, where I recently moved from Pisa University to join my research group. First of all, I would like to thank the Tech Task Committee to have invited me to give this seminar about the tectonic evolution of the metamorphic core of the Himalayan belt. I'm working in this uh, chain since many years and I'm strongly interested in the tectonic models regarding the exhumation of metamorphic rocks. A very brief overview on the Himalayas that uh, derived from the collision between the India and Eurasian plate, as we can see in this uh, simple cartoon from the USGS website, and uh, the Indian plate started to move northward several tens million years ago, and during his, uh, its northward movement, uh, a notion in between the two plates was completely consumed. The continental collision between the two plates gave rise to one of the most spectacular collisional belts, uh, running for more than 2,500 kilometers. This is uh, a simplified geological map of the chain, and what is very surprising is that uh, all along the belt, we can observe a spectacular continuity of the main tectonic units and also of the main tectonic boundaries bordering the different tectonic units. From this schematic cartoon modified from our colleague, we can see the main architecture of these uh, tectonic units and uh, starting from north, North, in orange, we can see the units derived from the ASEAN plate. In, uh, light in light blue, we can see the suture zone, that is the remnant of the oceanic uh, units uh, completely deformed uh, during the collision between the two plates. But what I'm really interested in are these uh, southernmost tectonic units that derived from the the formation of the Indian passive margin. And starting from the uppermost one, we can recognize the, what we call the Tethian Himalayan sequence. The pink unit is the greater Himalayan sequence, where well, we focused mostly on during this seminar. And the lowermost unit is the lesser Himalayas. So just to have a look on how these uh, tectonic units uh, are made, we can start from the uppermost, that is the Tethian Himalayan sequence, that is a non-metamorphic to very low-grade metamorphic sequence spanning from Cambrian to Eocene in age. And here we can see some very nice example of very low-grade metamorphic limestones from Ordovician and Triassic times. The lowermost tectonic units derived from the deformation of the Indian passive margin is the lower lesser Himalayas that is made mostly uh, by metacoarsites and phyllites and this uh, sequence is deformed uh, mostly under low grade metamorphic condition and it span in age from Proterozoic Pater Paleozoic to Paleogene time. The intermediate tectonic units, that is what we call the greater Himalayan sequence, is made by medium to high grade metamorphic rocks and it has been classically divided into three different units. The lowermost units, the unit one, is mostly made by kyanite and garnet bearing paragnites and mica schist with some minor calc silicates levels and boudin of garnet bearing amphibolite. 
garnets. Here you can see a very nice garnet bearing paraglise and here we have an example of kyanite bearing paraglise. Intermediate unit, unit 2, is mostly made by marble and calc silicate. Here you can see a nice example of uh, strongly deformed calc silicates. And we have also some minor amount of pelitic and psanitic rocks. Uh, the uppermost unit, the unit 3, is made by orthognosis and nematides. Here there are a nice example of nematides, mostly derived from uh, pelitic protholiths. And uh, the uppermost part of the unit is intruded by a huge uh, quantity of uh, lipograms. As I anticipated you before, all along the belt we have also a spectacular continuity of the main tectonic boundaries bordering the main tectonic units, and this is the case of the South Tibetan detachment systems that uh, bounded the upper Tethian Himalayan sequence from the lower Greater Himalayan sequence. This is a quite complex ductile to brittle shear zone. Uh, with uh, a top to the north northeast sense of movement and the displacement is uh, quite huge and it has been estimated that it's more than 200 kilometers. The lowermost uh, tectonic boundaries is uh, the main central thrust zone that divides the greater Himalayan sequence from the lower lesser Himalayan sequence and uh, this is uh, also in this case it is uh, a ductile to brittle shear zone, but with an opposite sense of movement and in fact kinematic indicators point for the main central thrust atop to the south and southwest sense of shear. In the pictures you can see very nice SC fabric in the uppermost left in kinematic indicators uh, related to the South Tibetan attachment systems, where in the bottom right you can see quite nice kinematic indicators pointing to a top to the south sense of shear for the main central crust. These are the main tectonic models regarding the exhumation of the Greater Himalayan sequence. And the main differences are among these uh, tectonic models regard the rheology of the unit and for example in the channel flow model the greater Himalayan sequence is supposed to be par partly melted while in the other model uh, it has been considered as a rigid wedge of metamorphic rocks. Another difference in these models is the altitude of the two main bounding shear zones and for example in the while in the channel flow and critical taper models the two shear zones are, um, are almost parallel, in the other two models they converge in the wedge extrusion towards the deeper levels while in the wedge insertion they converge, they tend to converge toward the foreland, and in this case the South Tibetan detachment system has been interpreted as a back thrust. In all these models, anyway, um, the authors uh, give a very high importance to the activity, to the role of this uh, shear zone, and uh, apart from the critical taper, the other three models uh, assume that uh, these two shear zones could be active at the same time to uh, give uh, rise to the exhumation of the tectonic units. So, uh, for all these models, the Greater Himalayan sequence has been regarded as a coherent tectonic unit, but uh, is it true? So, what we did during the last year
is uh, to start was to study uh, several sections of the belt running perpendicular to the main structural trend of the chain and mostly oriented, mostly located in central and western Nepal and more recently we moved to the northwest India. Our research is strongly field-based and this is just an example of one uh, geological map uh, that is uh, always the starting point of our studies. And this geological map is from Western Nepal and we mostly focused on the architecture and the tectonic evolution of the Greater Himalayan sequence and all along this study section what we found in the core of the tectonic units is a ductile shear zone that we called High Himalayan Discontinuities that is regionally developed These are some examples of some of these shear zones cropping out in different sections of the belt and it affects paragonites and in some cases mica schist. We have a very nice top to the south and southwest kinematic indicators with a very nice well developed mineral lineation trending mostly northeast southwest. These are some uh, microstructures with uh, kinematic indicators from uh, these uh, high Himalayan discontinuities and uh, also in this case at the micro scale the kinematic indicators confirm a top to the south and southwest sense of movement. These are a nice example of uh, mica fish or foliation fish. And looking also at the microstructures, we recognized uh, also some high temperature deformation mechanism active in quartz crystal, such as, for example, this uh, chessboard extinction in quartz uh, in the top down uh, right photos. And along the shear plane, we recognize that silimanite dynamically recrystallized. So, uh, this uh, shear zone is a high temperature ductile shear zone with top to the south and southwest sense of movement. We performed also uh, some PT estimation of the shear zone, and in particular, we studied uh, both hanging wall and footwall rocks. And uh, what we found out is that uh, footwall rocks experienced usually higher pressure values than hanging wall rocks. And myelonitic foliation develops under a decreasing pressure. Combining uh, all our data with some literature data regarding some uh, discontinuities already recognized in the core of the tectonic units, we found out that uh, a pressure difference in footwall and hanging wall rocks can be depicted for all these uh, shear zones. Next step was to date the shear zone and we did it through a petrochronology approach and this means that we dated the monazites in their textural context uh, and we also took into account their chemical composition that is strictly related in the case of metapelites to the pt parts of the host rocks. 
Uh, what we obtain is that the shear zones were active starting from uh, 26 to 25 million years and their activity lasted uh, for several million years and they ended uh, to be active around 17, 18 million years. But the most important things that we obtain is that uh, they were older than the main central thrust dated along the same structural section. Another important thing that we obtain uh, with the dating of the monazites is that uh, we detected the dichronicity between uh, hanging wool and foot rocks. And this means that uh, while uh, the foot rocks uh, was uh, exhuming, uh, the hanging wool rocks uh, were still uh, undergoing. And this is quite clear from the right diagrams where we represent with uh, green and yellow dots uh, the different ages acquired by respectively foot and hanging wool rocks during under thrusting the green dots and exhuming the yellow dots. This is the same things that, uh, for example, Kohn obtained for the Lantern Trust. Going back to a more regional feature, we can assess that uh, the Himalayan discontinuities can be traced for uh, several hundred kilometers all along the belt, and it divides the greater Himalayan sequence in two different units, an upper and the lower one. But uh, going back uh, a little bit and coming back to the Kaligandaki Valley, we found another important thing. And in fact, here we found another uh, shear zone, uh, that is the Kalupani shear zone. It affects uh, orthognizes, and here you can see some meso and microstructures from the myelonites. And uh, surprisingly, we dated this uh, shear zone with the same approach, I mean with the petrochronology approach. And uh, this shear zone was active uh, well before the high Malayan discontinuities. And in fact, it started to be active at around 40 million years. And here we can see uh, the red dots that are related to the ages uh, that we obtain through uranium thorium lead analysis from the monazites recrystallized along the main S2 foliation. So, uh, this is a very schematic sketch of the model that we propose for the exhumation of the Great Himalayan sequence. And uh, the most important things to note is that the unit is not a coherent unit, but we detected several shear zones uh, localized in the upper and in the middle portion of the unit. And these shear zones were active in different times, and they deeply affected the metamorphic and tectonic evolution of the greater Himalayan sequence. So in this um, scheme, we can see the first step with the activation of the Kalupani shear zone that is located in the upper portion of the unit that started to be active around 40 million years and it, it ends its activity around 30 million years. Uh, we should remember that this shear zone are all ductile high temperature shear zone with the top to the south southwest sense of movement. In the upper diagram, we can see very schematically very schematically the PT parts of the of three different points that we draw in the scheme across the unit. And so the concept is that while the hanging wall rocks started to be exhumed, the foot wall rocks uh, were continuously uh, transported downwards.
This is the second step of the activation. So the Kalupani share zone at this time uh, was not uh, active at all, but uh, the deformation was localized along the higher Himalayan discontinuities. So this is uh, the next time interval, but the game is the same. Uh, at this time, the hanging wall rocks uh, were exhumed, while the foot wall rocks uh, continue to be undertrusted. The last step uh, was the activation of a lower most, uh, the lowermost shear zone that can coincide with the main central thrust and uh, while the hanging rocks were exhumed, the futile rocks now represented by the lesser Himalayan sequence uh, continue to be uh, undertrusted. At this point, the question arises, uh, that is, uh, are the main central thrust and the South Tibetan detachment uh, coeval? Are they active at the same time? And, uh, for example, um, for Western Nepal, we have uh, a quite nice pinpoint because along this section we recognized a huge lycogranite body, the Buraburi body, uh, that is the, represented by the whitish rocks uh, at the base of this uh, landscape. And this lycogranite is an undeformed one and it crosses cut it, and it cross cut the both the greater Himalayan sequence and the upper Tetian Himalayan sequence that you can see very nicely in this uh, picture with the well stratified rocks at the top of the mountains. This granite has been dated and uh, its age uh, constrain the activity of the South Tibetan detachment system and the age of the lycogranite is much more older than the age of the main central thrust dated along the same section. Another pinpoint that we have uh, are some very recent data that we got in Northwest India, where we dated both the South Tibetan detachment system and the main central trust. And for the South Tibetan detachment system, we have some monazite ages that constrain the activity of this shear zone around 20 million years. But we have also some argon argon ages on muscovite and uh, we got uh, some younger ages. Anyway, the activity of the South Tibetan detachment system uh, seems to be uh, to end uh, around 16, 14 million years. Along the, the same section, we have also uh, the age of the main central thrust that seems to be much more younger, and in fact, it seems to be active till 6 million years. So, also in this uh, section, the two main bounding shear zones are not uh, coeval. If we want to come to some conclusion, what we can discuss is that uh, uh, the presence of ductile high temperature shear zone characterized with a top to the south and southwest sense of shear developed in the core and in the upper portion of the Great Himalayan sequence surely deeply affect the um, metamorphic and tectonic history of the unit and uh, drove their exhumation before, well before then the activation of the main central crust. And in fact, these shear zones are active in a time interval. Their activity lasted several million years, and they are always older where we got the ages than the main central thrust dated along the same structural section. 
And so we propose a model, an in-sequence sharing model, where the formation and exhumation migrated downward through time, affecting progressively lower levels of the unit and um, are creating uh, tectonic slices from the Indian plate. But uh, all these conclusions obviously open some questions, and the main questions at this point uh, can be the following. I mean, uh, which are really the relations between uh, the South Tibetan detachment system and the Himalayan discontinuity? And uh, the dichronicity between uh, the South Tibetan detachment and the main central trust uh, is uh, real, present uh, all along the belt, or is confined just to some sector of the belt? And the last one is uh, which is really the role of the South Tibetan detachment system in the exhumation of the Greater Himalayan sequence. So these are some references for those of you who are interested and I would like to conclude this presentation with uh, some really big thanks to my research group and to all the students that helped that this research could be done.